Okay. So Deb and finer things. Yeah. So the first, I'm going to say five to seven minute. I didn't have, I wasn't establishing a, a rain contact. I was kind of just letting her, because she always tends to, you know, suck back and get behind the bit and go into extension. So I just left her. Um, but I, I was just getting shaken around a lot. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to go up and down the hill. So I don't know why she's into that right now. But um, so I thought, OK, well, let me try rain contact and see what happens. Is that, is, is that what she needs? Because I'm getting sloshed around so much. So just FYI, when we go to look at it, see if you see a difference. OK, well, and you'll feel the difference. So if they're in extension, um, it's hard to feel the neck bones under all those tight muscles. So having a rain contact is just to get the information on what those bones are doing under all that muscle and soft tissue. So if you can have a rain contact where you're thinking of receiving the information from the horse's movement, but as soon as they want more rain, you're willing to let the rain slide a little bit, that's a contact without restriction. So when we really need to feel the skeleton, we need a leg contact, we need a seat contact, we need a rain contact. When they get behind the bit, even if you're barely touching the reins, you kind of have to lengthen them out and lighten the contact when they do that. So when you can't have a rain contact because they're constantly above it or behind it, you can still get the job done. It's just harder because you can't really stabilize the neck. So that's where I've been more and more uh, directing people towards either the outside bend or even on a straight line, not necessarily a circle. So if you're unstable in the saddle and you can't really feel where the neck is because they're above it or behind the contact, you can just start to overbend the neck and take that out of the equation. Okay. And that way you'll get a clearer sense of the four legs and the torso and feel the spine from the withers to your seat bone, even if the neck is bent to the outside. So she's not, I mean, she's totally safe to ride. So the inside bend will probably work against you because she gets wiggly and she'll tend to fall on the inside shoulder. So the outside bend seems to address the balance. It challenges the extension in a way that helps them find balance differently than if you use an inside bend. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we'll look at it and see. Um, but if you can't find that stability through the midline, then playing with outside bend of the neck can sometimes facilitate it. And it kind of works like, um, okay, flashback quiz. How do you pick up a canter when you're in the hunter ring or the jumper ring? How do you, That's what's that do? flashback quiz? Well, I was originally taught outside brain, outside leg. And then when I got there, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. So why does outside rain, outside leg work? It's the <laughs> traditional canter transition cue. Outside rain, so even if you tip the nose slightly or just have a strong outside rain, is supposed to help them lift the leading inside front leg and plant the power. So you push with your outside leg to tell the horse push off. That should be the strike off leg would be the outside hind as well as the balancing leg. So the outside bend works in a similar way. It helps them stabilize back onto the outside hind and it makes it impossible for them to lean on the inside front. So if you're stuck in extension and you're still feeling a lot of wobbledyness, that's where you can play with different degrees, maybe a teeny weeny bit, maybe a whole lot, but somewhere in there, she'll struggle a bit and have to, you'll feel the hind end and the saddle stabilize first. Okay. 
then you'll feel her change maybe the kinematics of the inside front and then she'll release the neck into length so you can it, it feels really weird because it's like she's over bending the neck but she's in extension in in her back yes that's what rafalco does too yeah so extension, thing. well and the neck position there's a typical use of the neck that reflects the back but the use of the neck can easily be corrupted so it no longer is a natural reflection of the back it becomes over curling getting behind do you know roll curl all side reins draw reins whatever can influence the neck so that it loses its natural relationship to the back so it's entirely possible for a horse to be forward and long with the neck, but behind the bit and in extension at the same time. Yeah. So that's why I've been kind of letting her have the length because, you know, it's taking a hold of her mouth or any contact has just not been successful. So I've been avoiding so, it. Because it just triggers that whole misuse of that whole neck. thing, dressage thing she went through. But um, so yeah, the best anyway. And ironically, you need the reins to help stabilize the neck because it's become so unstable. But that's where turns and circles, which we've worked on with her before, are so particularly helpful to her. That's what and I've been doing and really pushing her out of the turn like you told me to do with Tally. Yes. You know, really saying we don't go slower, we actually get more momentum around the turn. So I've, you'll see that in the video, I think with a couple of trot transitions, because that's what she just decided to do. Oh, great. Okay, let's look at that. Let me share it. Oops, I don't want that. I want this there. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, oh, cool. Oh, good. So let me make it full size. There we go. Yeah, it's so much better when it's full size and I'll try to move yeah. up them so we're not in the way. And it's about 10 minutes, so I'm just gonna hit play. I'll turn the sound off, that's always distracting. There's a little bit of a breeze, which was nice, but. Yeah, that's pretty good, Deb, so. For her, I looked at it and I went, oh, we have improved. I need to watch my videos more. <laughs> yes because she is, I think that's the best corner, sorry. That is as much length without over curling her neck as I've ever seen this mare capable of. That's, that's what I saw too. Yeah. And you can still see the muscular use gives her mm -hmm. neck a little extra kind of like round shape, but for her to lengthen her neck that much and not drop the pole is a big improvement. But you see how wobbly she is. You see yes. that. So I'm about to post. Vicky and I did a lesson today, but she only wants it to be for the group. So I'm going to post it in the Wexford student group, but it won't be available to the public. I did a whole drawing on the leg kinematics on a turn and why turns improve the engagement. Okay, cool. That'll be neat. And what I, I want you to go watch that lesson once I post it tonight, because that's exactly her issues are very Arabian like. Yes, I think she's better, but it, I can much, still. Much better. Much better. So okay. Keeping her straight on the turns. And if you use reins, play with only a bend away from the direction of travel if okay. you play with the reins at all she's actually accepting what you're doing the reins are pretty loose yes. and as soon as she drops the pole they have to be even looser that's just the deal but i like that she's offering to trot that you're pushing for a little bit of forward on that tight of a turn and that and she's cho she's choosing all of this i'm not choosing direction oh okay this you're not steering this not unless, well she wants to go back to the barn so that's the only steering that there is <laughs> but okay. she's choosing this hill she could go anywhere out in the pasture but she's choosing to, the hill 
And that's so interesting because she's going around making a right turn, a left turn. That's why mm -hmm. I thought you were steering her. Nope, that's all her choice. She's, the barn would be going, I just used an outside leg there because she wanted to go to the barn, but and yeah. then she just turned. So. No, this is really good, Deb. I think oh, thanks. you're at a place where I would start steering, but don't get in a battle about the steering. Okay. You can use the visual path of travel to help you refine the straightness through her midline because the rotation is a lot more under control. She's not pitching you way up on one side, way up on the other. Mm -hmm. So it's more that all the muscles that support the stability of the axial skeleton are weak. So she's shaky. So if you use a visual path of travel that's about a sidewalk's width, it'll okay. help you with the timing of resisting a tiny bit quicker to increase the stability. And it may be better, you can always in the middle of the lesson, if she starts dropping the pole, over curling, having a meltdown, losing forward, go back to what you're doing, it's working. You okay. might need more time here. But the improvement, the next step I would start to look for would be a, a, like a generous kind of 20 meter to 30 meter circle. You could use your arena, which is still okay. going to have a hill, but you could use three sides on a fence line as part of the corridor and then one part just through the middle. Um, working on the turn, you've got enough communication to really for the most part, address the rotation and the alignment. But I think what you're battling is she needs a little more engagement. And that's exactly what straight on a circle will help with is the placement of the hind legs deeper towards her center. So it's not like you've got the feel of the line of force down her midline. You've got the breaking and the pushing balance. You could keep going the way you're going. It's only gonna get better. And as soon as you can steer from the saddle on a circle of some sort, that would just help with helping her stabilize more on the hind quarter and increase the forward placement of the hind legs, which again will help with stability because she's just battling a little bit getting her hind legs underneath her. And I think that's half of the instability you're dealing with. You've got the straight line, but you need the turn with the straight line like that, where she slows down on the turn. Okay. She's increasing the engagement in that moment. So you can give a little bit of leg, especially if she falls forward on the turn but you want her to do just that, just what she did. So the adduction and abduction of the legs on the turn is what helps her learn to rotate through the pelvis and get okay. the hind legs more steady underneath her, a little bit steadier. But I think the little bits of trot and letting her choose her direction and a very, very light contact She's really not dropping the pole too much. She's taking the contact genuinely as much as I've ever seen. Yeah, the only time she does it is like when she trot transitions and then comes to a walk, she'll root sometimes with her head, like she's really falling forward. Yeah, the rooting is fine, but okay. she's, what I like is she's going into trot lengthening not contracting back and down, going into trot. And you know what we've been doing? I've been um, lunging, you know, straight doing a square mm -hmm. and having her and trotting for like 20 minutes for her to figure out how to improve her own use in the trot without me, because I can't ride that trot. <laughs> Well, that's definitely working. You can do the lunge line, like unsupported lunging will work. The decarpentry won't work because she'll just get behind. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah. so long- I started lunging and she, after about 10 minutes, when she begins to fatigue from that, you know, extension type trot, she finally lets go of her neck and says, oh, oh, this is much easier than. <laughs> yes. And the, you could play with uh, walking with her on generous moving circles on the long range for trot too. Okay. Because that will help with the engagement. Like if you, it's good that what you're doing on the lunge line and that's one way to do it. And again, if she gets behind, if she complains too much, go back to what you're doing that's working, give it more time. But long reins on a circle at the trot, you can give her the same support you're giving her in the saddle. And at trot, we have to be on some degree of a turn on the long reins all the time because we can't keep up with them. So it sort of plays with the loose idea of a circle. A circle doesn't have to be precise. You can be close and walk with her, but maybe play with the long reins at the trot on the ground. And- I usually can't keep her going on the long reins, but I'll try it again. Maybe she's in a different place now. If you've improved the trot on the unsupported lunging, then try it on the long reins. And like I said, long reins don't work go back to the unsupported lunging and just let her work through it. Because even though we can give them more support, sometimes more support makes things worse than less support. But it's a good idea to make her do a long trot. It's she has to trot a lot to get out of that habit. Yeah. um, Of this bouncy bounce. It is helpful. Yeah. It's helped her find that length tremendously. Yeah. And then what else helped is the grass because she wants to try to eat. Yeah, of course. (laughs) While she's trotting. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, get long and low at the trot. Let's try that. That's new. Yes. And I go, if they can get a bite to go without stopping the trot, have at it. Yeah. That That right right there. there. Yeah. Oops, hang on, let me pause. That right there. Um, she, she, it's all, it feels like she's just falling forward. Like she, I can't hold it anymore. She is. And, and this is a good thing to discuss because if she puts any pressure on the bit, I would give her the reins. Okay. Because when she meets the bit, her MO is definitely get behind her. Yeah. Right? Either way, she's falling forward. Right. She's falling forward whether you hold the reins or don't hold the reins. You're not controlling the fall forward from the reins. You're going to do that with speed adjustments and turns. But the, the drawback of not giving her the reins, like I want to see this again because she's lengthening, she's taking a gentle contact. What you're doing is... Yeah, to- I- I just got contact and then she, she'll fall. Great. Let her fall because right there. Yeah. Yes. The only benefit is if she is, let me go back just a hair. There. So this is where she's taking the contact, but she's starting to fall forward. When she drops the pole, when she goes into extension, She's just as much, if not more, weight bearing on her front legs. So when she actually roots and pulls on the reins, that's putting her back in a natural neck use relative to the true use of her back. So in other words, it's at least genuine, right? She's been on the forehand that much here and there, but she either over curls the neck and sort of holds there through the neck or she drops her back and lifts the neck a little, right? And it's really pretty minimal compared to what you had before. This is just a massive improvement. I'm so happy. Oh, thanks, thanks. But here, you can see that muscle definition. Yep. That still has some changing to do tone-wise. Okay. And so the only real benefit for horses that have been in long-term chronic extension. The only benefit of letting them have the reins and letting them truly fall into long and low 
is the change of muscle tone through the top line. Mm -hmm. And I look at it and I go, they're not really more on the forehand than they already have been. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So if she falls and puts pressure on the reins, don't drop the reins instantly, but let the reins feed out to keep the same feel, but not give her any resistance on the bit. Okay. So that way, if she pulls hard and fast, let the reins go hard and fast, but try to keep a connection, even if the rein length is closer to the buckle. And she's really been exploring this in the lunging of uh, going from high head and arched back and then just dropping her head and trotting with her nose on the ground, then back up. And it's like this seesaw back and forth. And I went, well, isn't that interesting? Yes. And that is always them coming out of extension. You get the biggest shift of the teeter totter from way too high to way too low, way too high, way too low. And instead of looking for long and level or basic balance or perfection, I let them do that because I go there. The only benefit, like I said, it's not stretching. The, no. the change of muscle tone already happens the second they have the impulse to lengthen, but then they lengthen and fall. So I go, if you're working on trot on the lunge line and she's choosing to walk and you're pushing her towards trot and you're doing transitions, you're gonna get her out of long and low that way, right? And if she keeps resorting to extension, that's because she's not stable without that excessive muscle contraction. Mm -hmm. So to me, the only benefit of letting them fall or dump into long and low is if they can't hold that consistently, then they're still resorting to excessive muscle use. Right. Once they can hold long and low consistently for like all of five consecutive minutes, right? Five consecutive minutes at walk, five consecutive minutes at trot is not going to kill the horse. It's not going to make them lame. But if you can't get five consecutive minutes, she doesn't feel stable enough to let go of that chronic shortening of the top line. That's what you have to, at least the first layer of stability with you not on her <laughs> is, can she find that in her own body? Can she find some stability through her axial skeleton, her pelvis, that she can just stay at least in long and low for five consecutive minutes, walk and trot both directions? She's not there. Okay, so you can not keep working on that. You can add the long reins to see if she gets there sooner with, okay. with the help of the long reins. If the long reins take you farther away from that, then just do it unsupported lunging. She has to find her own way. Then when you ride, if <clears throat> like, let's say 10 is, 10 is how we describe heavy and rooting and pulling on the reins and zero or one is her starting to drop the pole and get behind or get above the bit. What you're looking for with her is on the light side, we would say maybe a three, something that is definite, you can feel, but it's on the light side. So what you can practice with her when you're riding is, let me go back a little bit. <clears throat> No matter what she does with her head, and I would do this before I would play with outside bend, I would do this with the neck straight, but start trying to ride accurate circles. Okay. Try to steer from the saddle as much as you can on some type of circular pattern, or you could do a figure eight, that would work too. Okay. But try to get your path of travel a little bit tightened up okay. without doing it to the point that she starts pushing through you and going back to old habits, right? So you can give a little, you can resist a little more. You can give a little, you can resist a little more. But if you start a more accurate path of travel with the neck straight and you start to think, no matter where she puts her head, can I adjust my rein length in order to keep the same feel? 
Does that make sense? Totally. That's what I was starting to play with in the last few minutes. Like what, what is a level of contact that I can just feel something and not, you know, be going backwards. Yes. And so if you, it, because you're very well balanced and she's improved to the point where you're not fighting for the stability of your body, <clears throat> right? So as your body is more stable, especially from the seat bones to the head, think of your arms being free enough that basically like when I work with <coughs> kids, I do the itsy bitsy spider fingers up the rain and then wash the spider out, fingers gently open and let the rain slide. Okay. So you're gonna kind of gather the reins in, with your fingertips. So you're not really moving your arms, right? Okay. But you're gonna gather the reins up in your fingers. And then as soon as she, if she goes three, two, one, zero, try gathering the reins only to get a three, no matter where her head is, as long as it's straight. And the second she wants to go three, four, five, you're feeding out the rain length to keep it a three. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so if she tries to get behind a three, you shorten the reins until you get a three. And if she tries to pull, you just let the reins go, ideally keeping a three all the way out. Okay. Okay, sometimes it happens fast and, and we bump them by accident. But if you can build, and it, it's gotta be less than a five, otherwise she'll be behind the bit. It can't even be a medium feel. It's gotta be on the light side. But like a two or I would say three, it's gotta be more substantial too. <clears throat> so the, I, the concept of a three is what I would look for. And constantly, it, you're gonna find it's constant. Lengthen, shorten, lengthen, shorten, lengthen, shorten, while you balance and stabilize your seat and your torso. You might have to do that without steering at first because then the steering is gonna kind of muck that up. It, it takes a while for us to get that coordination to keep the three, no matter the rain length. And when you get that, I think you're gonna be able to feel her center line a little more clearly. Okay. And then what you're going to feel is if she gets below a three, you probably have a straightness issue. And I would use a turn with a straight neck to see if you could get her out from less than a three. <clears throat> and if it's- I usually add more energy to it. If she starts, you know, sucking back, as I call it, I usually say, let's go forward, let's go forward. And you can play with that because typically if they get behind and over curl the neck, the, the forward aid of the leg can typically be more helpful. If they get above the bit, shortening the neck, then the straightness use can be a little more helpful. Okay. But you can do both because if she gets to be less than a three, I would tone my back, which you're having to do pretty much the whole ride just for your own stability. So you're driving with the brake on all the time. All right? the time. The so, emergency brake on. <laughs> so then I would use enough leg to just say, don't stop or don't okay. slow down. But I wouldn't use so much leg that I wanted to increase the miles per hour. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, totally, yeah. And then if she falls forward into that genuine long and low, that's where I would begin really playing with the braking pushing. Okay. Right now, your back and core is pretty toned just for your own stability, which is helping. So I'm do that. But adding the leg, try letting her choose her speed, which might be slowing down, and exploring the braking. Okay. So you don't want to discourage that too much with this mare in particular. Okay. Because she's less engaged than Callie. She struggles with that a little more than Callie. Mm -hmm. But you can have enough leg on that just stabilizes the straightness you're helping her with, which could mean don't slow down, don't stop, but not necessarily increase the forward impulse. Okay. 
And if that doesn't work, then you know you do need to increase the forward impulse, but I would play with it those different ways. And only, I think it's kind of, it's a little farther along. Most of the ride, like as we're looking at it, you've got great steps of actual basic balance that are kind of floating in and out there. Oh, but good. there's a mild version of falling forward and a mild version of extension in between the little steps. The way you're gonna recognize the good steps is the saddle gets more stable. That's yeah. how you're gonna tell the difference between the little bit of falling forward like that and the little bit of extension the saddle will get more stable when it's truly the step of basic balance. And it, you might not even feel it stable enough to notice it right now because she's so quick in and out of those moments, but she's teetering very close to it all the time. But I wouldn't get too ambitious with her in the speed adjustments like we talked about with Callie, but Callie was more consistently in that deeper long and low. Mm -hmm. That's why we played with the speed and the turn a little more than finer things is ready for. Finer things is still shaky enough that she's resorting to mild versions of extension. So that tells me she's gonna know better than I how to pick a speed. So I'm gonna mostly try to let her pick her own speed but if she's really falling side to side, I might add a little bit of leg or a little more break. But with, with Callie, or sorry, with finer things, here it comes. See if I can pause it in the moment I want. No, it's a little farther along. It's almost at the end of the video. I'm gonna, I want you to see what I call the full Monty of muscle release, like okay. the the full, genuine, no question about it, no excessive contraction through the neck and back. And it's really kind of at the end where you let the reins go. So it could be, I don't know if the rein contact is affecting her getting there or not. You could play That's with my question. Two. You could play with a two, you could play with a three. It looks like she's using it. I like that. But when she starts to pull, that's the three, four, five, six, seven. Yep. And let me back it up just a smidge. We had a huge horse fly flying around. <laughs> ah. oh, it won't do the arrows. That. That is how deep she needs to be going. Wow. Yeah. And see, that's what she does at the trot. She'll all of a sudden just boom on the lunge line. Yes. And I sort of talked about this with Vicki in her lesson because she rode two Arabs in her lesson. It's very typical. Not, I mean, finer things is a warm blood, but I've always said she moves like an Arab. That's what happens when they learn to overflex the neck while they extend the thoracolumbar spine. And that's exactly what it feels like when I'm on her. Exactly. And that's what, that's what Arabs do because they're so bendy. They can overflex the cervical spine and put the thoracolumbar spine in extension in this at the same time. Arabs do it. It's a kind of a genetic predisposition. Rafalco, my warm blood did it because that can be the side effect of using too much leverage on the bit, too much too much head and neck positioning tools. Yeah, yeah. And so what I found gets them out of that for all Arabs and for warm bloods like finer things that move like Arabs, I find the nose in the dirt, right? Then you're gonna walk a circle with a straight neck while the nose is in the dirt. Okay. And that is how they get the, the muscle used to change through the lumbar and the sacrum. And that then allows the pelvic bone to start having more mobility where they can get the hind legs deeper towards the center. But that's a big part of the instability is the amount of disengagement she's still struggling with. So that's where circles and turns 
are going to facilitate better engagement of the hind legs. And then if you keep her center line straight and she's not going into extension on like find the appropriate size circle that helps her stay in long and low and let her kind of play with the speed to stay in long and low. And okay. that, that will help you figure out at what speed on what size path of, of a circle she can gain the stability through the hindquarters and stay out of extension. You need both of those components to come together. Mm -hmm. Improve the engagement, that's the work on the circle, on the straight circle, and then keep her out of extension. Should be just the neck lined up to your seat bones during the circle. Might involve outside bend, but I think you're already past that point. Okay. I don't think you're gonna need the outside bend to get it. I think. You're just going to have to play with what size circle at what speed to get it. Yeah. Well, getting her to do long and low for any length of time is a challenge. Well, and it's, she's got it. She's got it. You let her kind of more or less pick her speed. You played with the speed a little, you played with the rain contact a little. The fact that she chose to turn as often as she did. Yes tells you she's looking for the stability she's finding through the turn. That's so, what I thought. And, and I mean, this has just been the last week of rides. I mean, she usually is, wants to go out on the, you know, and use more space, but she's been choosing these little figure eights on the hills. Great. So I was like, okay, fine, we'll do that. Excellent. So I would take what she chooses and that would be the first circle I would try. Okay. So if you take one of these U-turns because she needs to move with her back and neck kind of this long, even though she's on the forehand. Okay, we know she's on the forehand. The circle itself is working on the stability of the hindquarter to get her off the forehand in the braking capacity. Finding the right speed is maybe with your legs. That's going to help get her out of the deep, long, and low. But I would want her there for five consecutive minutes before I would monkey with the speed too much. Okay, yeah, we're not yeah. there yet. We're definitely Even though it looks like nothing's happening for those five minutes of deep, long, and low, the amount of changes in muscle tone it's not balance, but it's like that's why people confuse it with stretching. There is a validity to the fact that the muscle tone is changing, not because they're in long and low. So the long and low doesn't change the muscle. The desire, that impulse for them to lengthen the muscles, which comes from straightness, that's what changes the muscle tone. Then we allow them to fall forward in order to keep that change of muscle tone. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's where long and low got confused with stretching. The release of excessive tension already happens when they have the desire to lengthen the neck. And then the more that is changing for her right now, the more she's also gonna fall forward because she doesn't have the control with those muscles yet. Mm -hmm. So the falling forward into a really deep long and low just tells me I got the change that I wanted. And if she can hold the change, then she's not going, you're not going to be battling that constant need for her to go back to extension. That's just a stability issue. She hasn't learned how to stabilize in the posture of long and low. Exactly. Right. But again, that's asking her to use different muscles than she's been using in chronic extension. So it's not yet balance, but it's a big change in the muscle use. That's the only benefit of it. And if you have long and low with the straight neck on a circle, you're beginning very gently, beginning the process of getting flexion and stabilizing the back and the hindquarter. Okay. Well, so, so if you were to take direction. one of her turns, and make it a circle, what size circle would that be? It's not very big. It's not very big. Not very big. 
Mm-mm. And she'll do that. She'll be going and then she'll just want to turn. It's like, okay, just stay straight. Whatever you do, just stay straight. Right. So let's play it a little bit and look at some of her chosen turns because you're not asking for these. No, I, she doesn't like to be told what to do. <laughs> right. So I would say that's closer to a 10 meter circle. Yeah, very and much so. Let's see what she does on every time she starts to turn. Just kind of there, start drawing your circle and follow oh, okay. the arc. That's a little bit bigger circle. So that was close. She's, she's to different going to the right than going to the left, definitely. Great. But it wasn't even a 20 meter circle. That was a half circle. It was probably maybe 15 meters when she turned that way. And on this side, let's see if it gets wider. It's a little tighter, fuzzy. <laughs> it's a little tighter, but I would say something slightly smaller than a 20 meter circle. Okay, we can do that. Or if you need the rail in your arena, I think a circle at one end is going to be a 20 meter circle, maybe even a little larger in your arena, but you could still start there. And then if you, what you could do is if she gets a little high headed or struggles, you could, you, in your arena, you could purposefully spiral the circle in a little tighter, see okay. if that helps her balance or makes it worse. And you could spiral the circle back out wider. So you could kind of play with spiraling in, spiraling in and spiraling out or just staying on the outer sidewalk of the circle. You could play with it all those different ways. Yeah, that is pretty darn good. I'm really happy. And she doesn't look quite as high in the croup as she used to look. No, nope, not at all. It's starting to level off a little bit. Her back is coming up little by little. She's still a little bit downhill from the croup to the saddle. But yes, nothing I can like feel she, that. Yeah, nothing like she was before. And she's really starting to get more level through her body. Yeah. Yeah, I'm almost to the point that I'm going to have to buy longer reins. I'm like on the buckle there. No, you don't need longer reins. No, 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 because it, it, when she goes to long and low, you'll have a straight arm keeping your reins. Okay. But if once she's in that really deep long and low that we just looked at, that's the only time your rein contact is not important. Okay. And then, like I said, by the time you get five minutes of it, even at the walk both directions, we'll be ready to move on okay. to lift, lifting the back. Great. But I just feel like she's gently, if we don't let her have the deeper long and low as a transitory phase, and you said she's doing that at trot on the lunge line. Yes, she does it more at trot on the lunge line that at down at walk or canter it, her yeah. canter is awful she goes into extension her yeah. walk is not improving where i see the most changes on the law on the lunge line at the trot so then that's her easiest speed to find balance but it's the hardest speed for you to ride exactly uh, that, that's why i lunge her because <laughs> i right. can't ride it but yes. you've done a great job at the walk which is easier for you, but it's really hard for her. That's why it's taken a long time. Naturally, horses that find their balance most easily at trot usually struggle at the walk and the canter. That's what horses she said. that find their balance the easiest at the walk typically struggle the most to develop the trot. But the walk and the canter will be easier for them. And so with her, I would trot her a lot on the, on the lunge line because that's definitely helping her body change. Yeah, it is. It and forces then, her to get out of her habit, but you know, we're trotting up for 20, 30 minutes. Good. And yeah. then when you ride her, stay at the walk 
but start putting her on circles immediately. Start tightening up that path of travel. I okay. think that's gonna work very well for you. I think you're gonna get a lot more consistency in the length and you're gonna start to find the stability coming through when you keep the path of travel. It's just, okay. it's not about the path of travel. It's just, she needs you to be more specific. Okay, I agree. She, she's made it this far with you not being specific. But I don't know that she's going to, that's why she's starting to turn more. She's mm -hmm. looking for the stability. That's all her yes. doing that. <laughs> yeah. And pushing her into the trot's not bad, but you could have given less leg and probably avoided that little bit of extension. Okay. And she might not have trotted, but a little bit less leg, as soon as the neck is floating up and the skull towards you, back off the leg aid. Okay. With Callie, it helped with this stability, but she's a very different horse. Totally. And Callie hates being unstable. So pushing for more speed makes her stable. Yes. With finer things, finer things is perfectly fine being a noodle. She's used to it. That's who she is. Yes. So if you give her too much leg, she's more prone to react with extension than Callie is. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So with finer things, the slowing down is what's going to make her more stable. And then if she falls into long and low, but you have her on some degree of a turn, um, you're golden. That's how you're going to get more engagement and more stability with this horse. Okay. Yeah. And it's already better. Like she, she doesn't get the pelvis rotated very well or very easily but it's much easier than it it's, used to be. It's moving at least. Yes. Yeah, and you see on the turns where she slows down a little, that's her best balance. You're right. And so yeah. I would just find that size circle. And because you have that hill there near the barn, that low area right by the barn with the fence, mm -hmm. that might be your area where you could kind of mark out a circle, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Or you could go around the tire. Yeah. <laughs> but some visual point of reference, if you don't want to be in the arena. She doesn't want to. And I, it might just be the sun and the bug. She might be choosing the, you know, being towards the shade more. I don't know. Yeah. But no, this is exciting. This is a little bit of deep, 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 long and low. And okay. she's going to feel like a different horse under the saddle. And what you'll be surprised is when they have this, you know, kind of Arab deal going on with the high croup, drop back, high head, wiggly, wiggly. What you're going to feel is in the long and low. And this is where I got away from, you know, people saying it's good or bad. I got no judgment if it's good or bad. What I felt was horses that have a hard time engaging and chronic extension, that level of long and low makes the saddle more stable every single time. That's how I know to say, try that. Because for her, when she's more long and level, which theoretically should be more stabilizing, more balanced, more flexion, what you feel is she's still wiggly. Yes. And this type of horse, what convinced me to allow the period of time with the nose on the ground was that was the beginning of getting the stability under the saddle. And that just goes, oh, your body needed it this way. I have no judgment about whether long and low is good or bad. I want to know, does it help this horse or not? Right. Period. right. I got no judgment of how the horse is going to get to find this. But you, like we've talked about on the podcast, the stability of the axial skeleton is paramount. It's just it. It is the thing. Yes. And so just the thing in horse and human. Yeah, all this, all the more research I do, that's where it's all leading to. And theoretically, theoretically, she should be more stable under the saddle in the posture she's in right this moment where I froze the screen. Mm -hmm. And she won't be. I go only through trial and error and experience do I know 
horses in her type of misuse pattern because they're sort of gross patterns. Each horse is individual, but the wiggly ones kind of gravitate to this and the stiff ones kind of gravitate to that, and blah, blah, blah. And with her, I've always said, she's kind of Arabian-like to ride. And mm -hmm. that is the only way to do it with most Arabians is if you let them have their nose in the dirt, that's where they're going to begin to find better flexion of their thoracolumbar spine. First, they're gonna find the stability, then they're gonna find the nucleus, the seeds of lifting and flexing the spine. And from there, then when you play with the speed, you get more lift of the back instead of being stuck in this perpetual extend, release, extend, release, extend, release, right? But if you don't give them that five consecutive minutes, and you may want to give her more, you may find the longer you leave her there, the more stable the saddle gets. That's what I mean by the only benefit being in the time she might need to change the tone of her muscles. Right. It's completely muscular. It's not the spinal flexion we want, but sometimes the body needs a period of just allowing the excessive contraction to dissipate. But in right now where she's at, the reason you don't have long and low consistently is because just as she tries to change that muscle tone from shortening to lengthening, she feels unstable. Exactly. So That's she, why I play with the rain contact. It's like, okay, do you need more support? Do you need less support? You know, what do you need to maintain that is my question that I'm always asking myself. And the rain support, again, theoretically, you're absolutely thinking on the right track, right? But I think with her, horses that are sensitive to the bit pressure, quick to drop the pole, I'm always at a below mm -hmm. a five. Okay. Okay, of a one, but below a five, that's all they can sort of take comfortably at first. And then if she increases it, you give the reins to encourage, yes, nose on the ground would be a great place for us to go. Okay. Don't Got discourage it. that. Even though with other horses, I would discourage that. Okay, I'll keep it just for her, just yeah. for her. With Callie, I would start giving her more brain resistance matching your breaking pushing use of your body at the same time yeah we've been doing that she likes that <laughs> yeah and she would use the rain resistance better than finer mm -hmm. things will yes. just yet just yet but it's yeah. so close i'm so excited <laughs> <laughs> it's getting there it is getting there like overall what you have really consistently in this video is 10 times the impulse to length, lengthen the neck versus mm -hmm. shortening. Yeah, that's what I saw. I, I mean, it doesn't, that's why I need to be watching my videos more because I didn't realize how much she had lengthened. Yeah. I don't feel it. Yeah. And when you push to trot, that's her strongest impulse to shorten the neck again yeah. is when you push to trot. So think of pushing, but maybe not to trot. See if you can okay. use your legs in a way that just keeps her this side of shortening the neck again. Yeah. Because you've got the right idea, but it might be a bit much for her. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. So just play nuance that a little bit. Play with various uses of the legs. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I would, that's the biggest change in the overall use and, and pattern of movement from what I've normally seen with her to this video. This is the first time you've got greater than 80% of the ride with her neck going forward and away. Forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Instead of and, up and back. Yep. Yeah. I, and I didn't feel it as much as I see it now, yeah. which is great. And what you're feeling is the little bit, the little bit of up and back is mostly pretty subtle. It's more obvious when you go to trot, but it's pretty subtle at the walk. But you're feeling the instability in the saddle. Yes. Rated to even the subtle version of the head and neck up and back. 
Yeah. Or back and down, as you would say in Alexander work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, see that little bit of trot was perfect. That was yeah. enough leg that she- She didn't go into extension. But she didn't go upside down, yeah. So Cool. There's Thank moments you. in there where you're gonna feel she's more stable, less stable in the saddle. That's how you're gonna tell when she's in a little bit of extension and when she's moving away from it. But for her to really stabilize the saddle with sort of her body type and use, she's she's going to find it easiest with her nose on the ground okay we'll work on that more yeah i'll i'll try to get her to graze more while she's trotting on the lens line yeah <laughs> yes. doesn't hurt especially because she wears a muzzle she'll she'll oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. push her forward and let her get a few bites to go yep yeah cool so any questions no nope. that sounds perfect Okay. Feel we're going in a good direction. A very good direction. With both of them. So. Yeah, this is probably the biggest change I've seen in her body ever. Like to really, to change her habit and pattern has been very tricky. She's, she's my tough one. You know, she's just. And they're so different, you know, it's, that's why it's kind of cool to have more than one, you know, because I have to constantly seek something different for either horse. Yes, her movement, and they'll both get to a place where you ride them the same, but how okay. you get there with each horse, they're two very different type movers, very yeah. different body types. So what you do with one will not be the same with the other until they start to move more habitually in the in basic balance then it'll feel more the same no matter which one you ride but the getting there process they're really different yeah but they're going to show you why you never have rules you ask yeah horse. and i i am always asking the questions uh and uh, well what about this does this work or does this work or you know and you have to be willing to have it not work <laughs> <laughs> exactly you've got to be willing to try everything in your pocket to see what works absolutely and i've had so many horses that it goes absolutely against the theory i understand yeah. i adhere to the theory i know the theory works but i go the way the unique body gets there i got no rules because the horse has no rules so I can't rule out anything. A little bit of extension can be beneficial for some horses. A little bit of long and low can be beneficial for some horses. A boatload of rain pressure works great for one horse and terrible on another. And exactly. so you just have to kind of let the horse tell you, but wherever you're getting that lengthening in a way and, and stability in the saddle. The stability in the saddle is the truth of the use of the back. Yeah, I agree. Which is really the stability of the whole rib cage, everything. And the neck included. But I'm really pleased. Oh, thank this. you. Because her body looks like she's developed different muscles finally. Mm -hmm. She doesn't look like the same horse. No, she doesn't. And I didn't realize it until I watched this video. I went, oh that's a different horse <laughs> yeah good yeah you can see she still struggles a little bit with the engagement there's a little bit of rocking through the pelvis still yes. that's the instability so typically in this pattern the breaking is going to be more helpful to her than the pushing pushing okay and that's why i'm saying let her choose her speed on a circle and the the breaking with the nose on the in the dirt is typically how they begin to find more engagement and a little bit of lift of the back. Cool. Oh, they're the other doggy. That's Lucy. Lucy, that's right. <laughs> she's put on a she's bigger and has more hair, I think. Than oh that. my god, the hair issue is awful. <laughs> A weekly grooming. 
Yeah, so let's leave it there. I'm gonna yes. stop the share. Cool. But excellent, excellent, excellent. I would say with both of your girls, you're on such a good track. And how's Mr. Plumley? He's okay, in and out of soundness, just really battling soundness this year. I don't know why. Um, so I got him some new Easy Care boots to ride him in and seeing if that helps. Okay. <clears throat> the farrier says, no, I'm not putting shoes on him. It's, it's gonna ruin his feet even more than they are. <laughs> okay. And he said to just figure it out. So I am, and the ground's so hard right now. It's just. Can he do long reins on a circle? I have never tried because he sucks back so bad when I first got him, but I could try it now. Try it and see. Because he's more accepting of, of new information. When I first got him, he'd be like freaking out. You want to do what? You want me to do what? But now that he's relaxed a little bit, he's like, oh, okay, I'll try that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, see if it's, um, if you struggle with it a little, take a video, we'll do a lesson on it. Okay. But try that with him if he's unsound to ride. But even if it's just the walk for short periods, 10 to 20 minutes, maybe start working on the straightness on a circle for the same reason I'm talking exactly. about. Exactly. He needs that. Thing. He does need that. Um, what's interesting is, and I'm thinking it's, uh, it may not just be his feet because he comes out of the stall just very, eh, 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 eh. but then when he gets out and by the next morning, he's fine. So I'm wondering, do we need to get him on some magnesium? Do we need some MSM? And do we, you know, do we need, is, it, is there something muscularly that I'm not addressing that he's just kind of all tied up from being in the stall? It, they can get, the more he's on the forehand and if he's not working, it gets worse and worse because everything's contracting when, especially if they're not moving. So once he's out and moving, he's better. Yeah. It could be arthritis. It could be muscle soreness. It could be a bit of tightening up from lack of work. Like just because my life got busy, my horses have not worked in a week. And they look crippled if they're not working for a whole week. Yeah, now I have been working him because he, you know, of his, you know, insulin problems, but it's not, it can't be daily. You know, it has to be like every other day. He needs that day in between. Yeah. So the MSM is a great thing. It's cheap enough. I That's think what I'm thinking about trying. I just want to try one thing and yeah. see if it helps. That really helped Prima. Okay, I'm gonna try it then. Where did you get it? I got it at the feed store and oh, it was okay. like $35. I looked at the container, it was a four pound container for like 35 bucks. Oh, that's not bad. And you feed like one ounce twice a day. Okay. And that made a huge difference very quickly with Prima. Okay, that's what I was thinking last week when I worked him. I was like, we, I'm missing something. So I'm going to try that. Okay. All right. Cool. So I got to go there. Let me stop the video.